Welcome to all you storm watchers, storm chasers, and linearologists out there. Welcome to another edition of Tempest Talks, where we discuss lean philosophy, principles, and tools, and how they impact our personal and professional lives. Today, we will be discussing culture and guiding principles with my friend Ken Snyder. By way of introduction, Ken was named chairman of the Shingo Board and executive director of the Shingo Institute in 2015. Previously, he was the Executive Dean and Chief Administrative Officer of the John M. Huntsman School of Business and has served as a member of the Shingo Executive Advisory Board since 2009. He has intimate knowledge of the Institute, its history, and has been a Shingo examiner since 2010. Welcome, Ken. We're really excited to have you with us today. Thanks, Michelle. It's great to be here. Did I miss anything? Um, I might just add that prior to uh, coming to work at the university, I spent 30 years in industry, almost exclusively in manufacturing. So I come from a heavy, you know, making it, making stuff, if you will, background. <laughs> and I studied lean and I tried to practice lean as best I could for those 30 years. But it's been fun to join the Shingo Institute and and figure out how to teach it better to everybody else so they don't have to struggle as much as I struggled to learn the lessons I've tried to learn. Oh, that's brilliant. Um, we all love that practical knowledge for sure. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, what types of industries uh, did you work in? Initially, electronics industry and then the, the printing and publishing world. Oh, wow. Wow. But on the production side, we had plants and ran ran pr production lines of, of you know, I, I, I developed an almost one piece flow uh, production plant for our, our printing operation, which was oh my gosh. a fun exercise back in the 1990s. So wow. the principles of one piece flow, no, or as Shigo Shingo called it, non-stock production. That was kind of a, a fun challenge to try to get to that. And we had a... a one little part we couldn't totally get to one piece flow, but it wasn't even true batch that even then we weren't batching things. We were, we just had to had an environmental issue that we couldn't solve, so we had to take the line had to go outside back inside, so we had a special room for it. But wow. but in, you know it's it's fun you know to do a you know we were twenty minutes from beginning to end from the oh time my gosh started, that's amazing started the production to the time we finished production that was. A really, really great uh, flow, if you will. Wow! And so, yeah, we lots of lots of good experiences in industry before trying to learn how to teach it, and uh, <laughs> which sometimes is the harder part, believe it or not. <laughs> no, no, it actually isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, it, it's fun. We're named after Shigeo Shingo, who yeah. was the, an industrial engineer who was hired by Toyota to help them develop the Toyota production system. And so he has mm -hmm. intimate knowledge of, of all of this, but it, there's, it's interesting to read Shingo's, uh, for example, his book about the Toyota production system and compare that to Ono's book. So oh, here, you, yeah. here you've got, here you've got the guy who spent almost his entire life as a consultant yep. writing about it. And you got the guy who's actually doing it, <laughs> writing about it. And it's it's kind of interesting to see their different perspectives. And now I understand Shingo's perspective. Maybe before I was a little more on the Ono side because I was the practitioner trying to figure out how in the world can I do this. Right. And, and of course, the 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 sensei, if you will, the person who's the consultant gets the chance to say, "Well, this is the ideal. You should yeah. do this." Uh, and, you know, yeah. And and then then there's also, but I have to build a car. Yes. <laughs> And those two don't always meet. I don't no. know how to build a car and do what you're telling me to do, Sensei. So sometimes they don't. The ideal might be something you strive for, but you still haven't figured out how to get there. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I I never thought about, of course, you know, in the early, early days of the of the TPS system, you know, what kinds of things would have come up for all of the, you know, the master senseis. The big, the big difference they had was about Kanban and, and Ono couldn't figure out how to, how do you get 10,000 parts all together to make a car at the same time as you're running a line. And to him, you know, a Kanban at least turned it into a pull system instead of a push. Right. Right. But Shingo, Shingo called, uh, and I'm quoting here, I have him on video. <laughs> Shingo called Kanban nonsense. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and, 
And I think there's a couple of reasons why he did that. I'll, if you want to go into it, we can. But but I think the key reason he didn't like Kanban is because it locked in inventory. It made sure you had a certain amount of inventory. And inventory is always evil, to use the word Shingo while he True. used. True. Inventory is evil. All inventory is evil. There is no such thing as necessary evil. There is just evil. <laughs> And and so it was, it was kind of fun to see how they went back and forth about Kanban because ah. Ono had to build cars. And, and it's like, okay, show me a better way where I don't have to have any inventory. I think we've got pretty good at reducing it. And we've got pretty good at creating pull. Yeah. How do I get 10,000 parts right at the, just in time to the right, right place? Now. Right time, you know, how yeah. do I do that without something like Kanban? And and Toyota still hasn't solved that entirely. They've yeah. gotten better and better and better, but they still use a Kanban system. Yeah. And then I see people, you know, and here's where I think Shingo worried about it. And I think he was justified is because a lot of people copy Kanban yes. without thinking through, maybe we could do this without Kanban. Yes. We, agreed. We don't have 10,000 parts coming together. We've only got 30 parts. Can we, we can do this as a one piece flow. Yeah. And do Kanban. And Shingo thinks everybody just reverts to Kanban because that's what Toyota does. And that, I think, was part of his concern. It wasn't just that Toyota couldn't do it because of the complexity of the product that they're making, but then other people copied them. Wow, and that's amazing. That's why, and that's why I think he called it nonsense because he said, don't go to Kanban first. Right. How to do one piece flow first. And then if you have to do Kanban as a step to getting there, it's a tool that you might use. That makes but, total but sense. But he saw too many people adopting it that didn't need to. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, because we're, you know, we're taught in all of our lean lessons and stuff. Of course, inventory is evil because it ties up cash. You want the flexibility. Well, that, it, hides, it hides quality problems. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it disrupts flow. It, you know, there's so many different problems that come with inventory. Try, yeah. you, know, the, the, you know, you reducing it to nothing is the ideal. Yeah, for sure. But... <laughs> That's why a lot of organizations, you know, tend to, they may outsource for a while, but then once they start to get really good at it, they start to realize, actually, I think we could do it better. So we're going to insource it. And then that creates more of that one piece pull kind of situation. So that's, that's awesome. We used to chant at the aerospace company. It's all about flow. It's all about flow <laughs> because people would immediately jump to solutions like Kanban or, or to um, standard work. And they would think that it would solve all their problems. And it's like, wait a minute, you're in this situation, you're standardizing waste in this standard work. You haven't removed the waste. You haven't looked at flow. So we've constantly, you know, gone, no, it's flow, 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 flow. Um, that was one of our, as a segue, um, that was one of our principles. Our guiding principles was linkage and flow first. Um, we always were constantly thinking about how do we link our departments together, our value streams together, whatever it was, and how do we help them flow? Either communication or tools or product or whatever, making it flow. Um, but when I, you know, when I say you know, a lean culture then and guiding principles, what would that mean to you? as a as a shingo institute so um, individual as a practitioner i i and starting you know I, I wrote i wrote my master's thesis on applying japanese business practices to western companies oh interesting In 1980 before there was a, a word lean that yeah. applied to this um the closest thing i had in the the what i used in my in my paper was a book called theory z written by a professor at ucla named bill Ouchi. And and it was kind of me melding some of the theory X practices that Western organizations were used to to theory Y, which is what uh, Professor Uchi had labeled Japanese business practices. And there were a couple of good books, one of them by my advisor, whose name is Mike Yoshino, who is a Japanese guy who taught it, where I got my MBA. But but they had, there were some good books out about Japanese business practices, and it was like trying to put them together and how do we do this and. Be that was before there was anything written about Toyota, other than people were starting to study Toyota because of how well they had done during the oil embargo oh, era. That makes sense. And, and how they had managed to keep profitable when nobody was buying cars. You know, it's ah. like, 
because nobody could get gas why buy a car if you can't exactly. get gas type, type of thing. so with with all that going on um you know we we were all trying to learn more about toyota but we learned as much as we could you know those of us who are interested in this and i was one of them and wrote, wrote like i said a master's thesis about it yeah i went to work for a japanese company when i finished my mba but i so i immersed myself into the japanese business practices i went and worked in japan i'd already had lived there before and i went and went back and worked there and and learned what i could and it was the middle of the tqc spc yep. change in japan deming was still highly influential Ishi, uh ishigawa's mm -hmm. I, I remember the very first meeting i went to at our qc circle when i joined the company we everybody got a copy of of ishikawa's book uh, and, and so I got to read in Japanese Ishikawa's book on SPC wow. and we went through each week would go through and, and study a chapter and then talk about how can we help this improve our process. Amazing. And, and so we were you know doing what we what we could do. But getting back to the question you asked is yeah. it was hard to understand what to do because we didn't understand the underlying whys very well yet. Ah, okay. You know, mm -hmm. so even even if we saw tools like SPC and said, this might help us with this or this might help us with that, we hadn't made the linkage as to why. Why yeah. would this particular thing help so much? Or why would that particular yeah. thing help so much? We knew it, would, it might help and we were trying to get better. But we learned the hard way. We learned by trial and error. Mm -hmm. And we learned, oh, this works better than that, or this, mm -hmm. oh, this works in every, we need to do this all the time. Yeah. And those things weren't that evident then. And then we got, then story, the books about Toyota came out. We had Shingo's book and Ono's book, and then the, the Machine That Changed the World book. Mm -hmm. And that gave us more to study and see, oh, that's how Toyota does it. That, that's yeah. a better way. Even then, the why was not well explained. Hmm. And and one of the things I love about the Shingo guiding principles is it is an accumulation of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Why should you do this? Why should you do that? It's explained in the principles. Yeah. And when that came out, it was like, yeah, I'd learned that one, that one, that one, that one. You know, some of them I'd learned the hard way, and some of them I had to think about a little bit because yeah. am I really doing that? Or should I we should we really be doing that? Yeah. But it was but it was the best attempt yet and i still think it's darn good the best attempt yet at explaining why we should do the things we should do and yeah. when we know why and i'm going to pull in a little bit of shigi oshingo here again because he saw people you know many you know thousands of people go study toyota oh i i'd imagine hundreds and, of thousands and yeah he, he referred to it and his son also his son who worked that i got to be good friends with dito oshingo um both of them had the same complaint is and, and Dietzel worked for Toyota for over 40 years and he said people came all the time thousands and thousands of people would come look at Toyota he called and they both called it industrial tourism oh totally and it's like they're, I was they're one coming, of those they're coming, to see, they're coming to see but yeah. they're not coming to know why yeah and yeah Shingo, Shigeo Shingo wrote about it in his books he says it's not sufficient that you know how yeah you need to know why yeah, exactly. If you don't start understanding the principles behind it. This is now Ken talking. If you don't understand the principles behind it, you will never understand the why. Yeah, I agree. And that's why those the guiding principles are so crucial to being able to learn this better and faster. And it doesn't take you the you know, have 40 plus years it's taken me to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And I've, I've probably learned more in the last you know, eight years as the executive director of the Shingo Institute than I did in the 30 years I spent in industry. Yeah. Even though I was trying to learn as I went and, and I struggled and, and tested and tried and failed and learned, but, but yeah. it was hard. It doesn't need to be that hard. Yes. And thankfully. <laughs> and as an educator, yes, as an educator, then I said, you know, we learn the hard way. You don't need to follow in our footsteps. Be yeah. smarter than we are. <laughs> you have the opportunity to be smarter than we were. Yeah. So let's 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 do it better. Let's get better faster. Let's raise you. Know, let's you. Know, you can do this faster. You don't have to take so long to learn the hard way. Oh. So, and as we understand why, we can do that. We can start yeah. thinking about 
well, how can we better do this and think about the principle and then think about if we do these actions, if we do these behaviors, then we can get there. We can get better faster. Let's try it. Yeah, I love that because, um, you know, I thankfully, thankfully, um, I've been able to learn from individuals like yourself where they learned it the hard way. And, and the reason why they're so passionate about it is because they learned the hard way where it's like, we do not need to repeat our, the sins of the past. Like we do not need to do that. Learn from our stupid mistakes, please. Yes. (laughs) And (laughs) what's crazy is we continue to make stupid mistakes. (laughs) All of us do. We all definitely do. But if we're, if we're smart as you know, what I, I like to call us linearologists because we're scientists about lean, right? Um, I like to call us that it's because we should constantly be learning and benchmarking and then uh, applying stuff and then trying it again and reproving it. So it's almost like as a practitioner, as a facilitator, whatever the position is, as a lean person, um, we should be testing these things out. I always get disheartened when I run into a uh, lean professional that's so black and white about things. Where it's like, no, our next step is we we need to do Ishikawa every single time. We've got to do a you know a fishbone diagram every single problem. Do we? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, if I do know problem, what you mean. <laughs> I do what, know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, is the problem uh, one that it would benefit from that, or are we just going through the motions because somebody told us that that's the tool we have to use all the time? Um, it's a very interesting concept when building culture too. I I wonder, and through all of your studies, sorry, I'm switching gears a little bit here, but um, was, was it um, not easier to build a culture, but was it um, more, I, I don't know how to say it, because um, Japanese culture is more collectivist than individualistic um, like American society or, you know, Western world society. So was it easier, for lack of a better term, um, to implement a culture of inclusivity and problem solving in a Japanese society than it was in ours because of that it's, collectiveness? It's, it's well, Let's take the collective side out of it for a second. And okay. I'm obviously, so I got a chance. Uh, I, I worked for a few years in, in, in the plant in Japan and had the opportunity to run one of the production lines. It was a fairly new production line. It was in ramp up mode and Ooh. and we had lots and lots of problems. Okay. Yeah. And then I got it. And I think the the CEO assigned me to that because the what he hired me for eventually was to go back to the U.S. and start up a plant in the U.S. and then I'd go, be going through startup there as well. So, so I got the I got the chance to see a startup production line in both both instances. Yeah. One with a group of experienced Japanese employees and one with very inexperienced American employees. Okay. And I got to do this within a couple of year period, so I got to see the the difference almost immediately. Yeah. Almost immediately. So very fresh here's some things I observed when we had a problem with the experienced Japanese workers and would get together and would try to look at the problem and say, what are we going to do about it there? And initially they would always do this. Oh. Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> Anything you think we should test? <laughs> um. It was it was kind of frustrating because I yeah. was just, come on let's brainstorm let's let's at least, what oh, what wow. might be causes here we could do a fishbone diagram what do we should what should we do about that yeah <laughs> now what I found though is is after they had thoroughly analyzed it on their own they would be willing to talk about it and they would come oh. with with a solution not just ideas. The whole idea of brainstorming was not something that they were comfortable with or would do. Interesting. They just don't do it. At least yeah. maybe they maybe they've started now. That they've been influenced a little bit more by Western culture, but 
<laughs> but in the 1980s, there was there was Nothing. No, no response at all. Fascinating. But when they came with an idea or they came, it wasn't just an idea. It was an idea with a solution attached and they had already tested it. That is cool. Kind of a complete, you know, here's the package. Yeah. But in the meantime, they just sat silent and we had no discussion. And it was very frustrating to try to, to do something. Okay, contrast that. I'm now starting up. Similar type of problem comes up. We get the team together. And we get, I get ideas that are, you know, <laughs> there may be a hundred ideas put up in the first five minutes of which maybe one or two have merit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most of them are just that you got to be crazy. Think about it. That's not a good idea. No, you don't ever call an idea a bad idea. I understand. Right. Okay. But a lot of more bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were and, and they were bad because they were uninformed. They were new, they were untrained, and mm -hmm. they were trying to tr they were trying. And so you don't want to you don't oh, want yeah, you don't want to hinder enthusiasm. that. Yeah. You want the enthusiasm. What I found though is it took a while to train them better. And then as they got more training their ideas got better and better. Interesting. And and the one other transition I saw was as the I at first many of the ideas entailed things that I should do. You know, can you should do this or can you should do that or or the engineer should do this. It was, it was always about what other people should do. Yes. As they got better trained and understood and, and accepted responsibility for their own work, which is what, what we wanted them to do, then it became, we should do this. And I can do this part, but I need help with that. With that. You know, and, and so I, I got to see this transition from kind of a, a, a level of ignorance and, and inexperience to a, over time, seeing them to much better ideas, much more ownership and responsibility for it. And it was it was fun to see that transition over time. Yeah. Well, but, very rewarding, I would imagine. And, and 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 hopefully I didn't kill too much enthusiasm along the way by <laughs> just going, oh, come on, think harder, guys. Think, or think better. We used to call those um, let's make the fan cow out of a marshmallow moments. <laughs> Where it's like marshmallow does not make sense at all. <laughs> like it's not the aircraft's not going to get off the ground. Yeah, We're making it out of marshmallow. So that's what we'd call it, marshmallow moment. <laughs> so, anyway, that, I hope that gives you kind of a contrast between yeah. different cultures. It I, definitely I, does. I go back to why, in a collective society, why are they so reluctant to say anything until yeah. they? have an answer and i i think it comes from the way they are taught in the schools oh the interesting um there is there's an old adage in in japanese that that, that you the the nail that sticks up gets hammered down oh okay uh, i witnessed that in, in going and visiting some of the classrooms in their schools while i was living there and yes they they don't speak up in class at school uh wow. they, and and it's it's it leads to very much recitation type learning, which is much less powerful than thinking. Yeah. And and so they've just been conditioned, I think, to don't say anything until you know the answer. You know, you don't raise your hand in class until you know the answer. Wow. You don't, you don't speak up in your QC circle meeting until you know the answer. Now, how to how to break that so you can get people to start thinking about what kind of testing should we do yeah. to answer this question that we're trying to get to the bottom of, you know, this problem we're trying to get to the bottom of. How do we design a scientific test to be able to test this and then that and then that to figure out what's what the problem is? Wow. It's hard for them because they're not taught to do that in school. Fascinating. That makes so much sense. So, but, and then that also blows my mind, too, because we often talk about the culture of Toyota and the culture of problem solving. So if if you have a society that, you know, doesn't like to speak up until they know the answer, how does problem solving work in that yeah, culture? The, the idea of brainstorming still doesn't fit into any culture that I've seen in Japan. Fascinating. But, and, and I, I think that's that's a loss to them. It's a disadvantage yeah. to them. Now, their sure. thoroughness and their re taking of responsibility, the, the their ability to work in teams, 
just mm-hmm. comes naturally to them. They are so used to it and it's so much a part of their society. Yeah. It's hard for us to get a bunch of individuals together as a team. Mm-hmm. It's not hard for them at all. They they just assume they're part of a team going in. They act as a team. They yeah. think as a team. They don't, there's the, the idea of this rugged individual yeah. is not part of their culture at all. And they don't generally don't think that way. And it's not a problem. Wow. You know, people, lone wolves going off and doing weird things, you know, which can be yeah. both a plus and a minus, you know, you, sometimes yeah. weird things result in some really creative new solutions that nobody ever thought of before. And you can make some really good advancements, but sometimes it's just a big waste of time. <laughs> and money. Yeah. And money. yeah. So you know they don't have to worry about things like that so it's there's pros and cons but it's a different yeah. it's a very different environment different culture yeah that's very interesting but what i find is consistent mm-hmm. is the principles are the same ah how how to apply the principles is mm-hmm. different because the culture is different but the principle is universal the principles are universal so so for and I'll, let me just pick one since yeah. we're talking about culture um, respecting every individual, they're very good at respecting everybody else because they look at everybody else as part of the team. Right. They, if if somebody's doing something, they care about the work that their team teammates are doing. They want to make sure their teammates are doing good work, and they no, rely on their teammates to tell them, "Hey, we've got a problem with what you're doing." <clears throat> that all comes very naturally to them. They respect one another. And to a large degree, leaders just naturally respect the people in their organizations too. It is, you, you talk to them about respecting every individual and they just kind of go, yeah. Yeah, like, why are we bringing it up? <laughs> why, why yeah. do we need to talk about this? You know? Yeah. But to them, it is so natural. And, and and when we go into other cultures, you know, and, I, and I'll use, I'll go back to Theory X. I don't know if many of your listeners will know what Theory X is. Look it up. But it's a, it's a, it's a description of the American command and control oh, military yes. structure that has mm-hmm. permeated a lot of corporate America yep. is this command and control where, you know, you don't have to respect, you just, you know, you don't have to respect people. You just need to tell them what to do. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and that doesn't get them engaged. That doesn't get their idea, their brains going. It doesn't get them thinking about improvement. They just think they're a robot and are being treated like a robot and they go act like a robot. Yeah, it's true. It's amazing how quickly we um, have that happen in our lives too. Like, cause I've worked for several different companies where the, the behaviors have been different. The cultures have been different. Some have been very theory X. Um, uh, and ironically, one of them, it was a military person that was in command. <laughs> so um, those individuals, did they that were word like, command inten- intentionally. I think. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, we, and this is terrible, but we had this center section of, of the shop that uh, was nicknamed the Eagle's Nest because um, this individual would stand up there and watch people work. And so the, um, the employees, their response to that was exactly like what you're saying, where it's like, I'm not going to make a change because I don't want to make waves. I'm just going to wait to be told what I need to do, which is the biggest killer for continuous improvement in culture change. It's maybe, maybe not the biggest. I can think of a couple of bigger ones. Like oh, yeah. In an unsafe environment. Oh, that, of course. Uh, yes. Yes. But, for sure. But it's the second biggest. Yes. Yes. <laughs> At least that's sure. what our research has shown. The, the biggest kill people, if the people are worried about their safety, they will not think about improvement. They're going to oh. think about how can I make it home today? Yeah, and for sure. Keep working and, and not get hurt. But yeah. once you get once you get that basic environment uh, safe, you have you know people feel safe to to do things and say things and not not get hurt. Yeah. Then that is the biggest thing you can is is just not res- respecting them as a person and their ideas and their ability to contribute. You you kill that by not listening, and that's and that's why the we in the Shingo Institute in the Shingo model we have two key principles that work together. Yeah. And one is respect every individual. The other is lead with humility. And that really means as a leader, we need to be open to realizing that other people have great ideas. Yeah. Even, even if you're if you're the boss, other people have better ideas than you do when oh, it comes sure. to different topics. Listen to them. 
Yeah. You're, you're better together. <laughs> And I don't know why it's so hard for some folks. Well, it's probably a, a hint of pride um, <laughs> that some folks have a hard time, you know, listening to someone else. Um, it's probably got a little bit of pride involved in that, too. Well, and, and we drive that. Our culture drives that, though, too. You know, we, yeah, it does. And, and I and it's unfortunate. We, we think of, of, you know the commander needs to be the commander, you know, and we use the title commander and, and or captain, my captain yeah. or you know, whatever. And, 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 you know, we even say captains of industry, we use a yeah. military term to describe a lot of this. And it, it implies that it is a command and control environment when it should not be. That's a kind of culture that will kill improvement. And we've got to realize that and we've got to just, you know, I, I'm in favor of discarding those kind of things in favor of leadership and true leadership is how to, is about how do I make the team better? How do I get the team the resources that they need to keep improving and keep, you know, you know, doing great work yeah. and how do I get them the right training? How do I, you know, that sort of thing is, is what true leadership is about it's yeah. not about commanding and controlling every little thing. Yeah. So how do you know that you've chosen the right guiding principles to, you know, foster that kind of environment and culture? Well, it's, it's easy to observe. Mm. Um, you know, it, one, one good test that I have as a, when I'm a Shingo examiner and I'm visiting a site that has applied for the Shingo prize, I like to ask people, have you submitted any ideas for improvement? Huh. If the answer is no, okay, we know that there's a reason why they, that's not because they're not smart. It's not because they don't know their job. There is a reason why they have not submitted yeah. any ideas. For sure. So when, if they answer yes, then it's not, well, tell me about the last one you did. And, and what you'll see is, oh, I, this is what I did. And they, people get excited. They show you, they'll even kind of draw it out on a paper or they'll take you to their workplace and they'll, I did this and this and this, and it did this, you know, the result was this. And, and wow. then you can do a follow-up question. Like, why did you do that? What was the purpose of doing it? You know, and you can have a really good discussion with them about their ideas, but along the line, you can also ask questions like, did you get support for that from your supervisor? Ah. Did you get the resources you needed to implement it? And you can learn a lot about how the organization functions mm -hmm. by asking team members about their ideas. You can find out, that you, you can find out, yes, our culture invites me to come up with ideas. They give me the support I need. When it got delayed, they told me that it was delayed. Yeah. You know, I felt respected through the process. You can get all of that just from a simple beginning question like, have you submitted any ideas? Wow. And yes, wow. what was the last one you did? And and then probing as you go. Yeah. And that gives, that tells us as examiners, there's a really good culture here because people are really encouraged to come up with ideas. They get the support they need. The, the ideas get implemented and it makes a difference. And people feel like, oh, my, I'm valued and I should come up with more ideas. Yeah, <laughs> ideally, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, we I should have be so thinking, many. I better be thinking about the next one. Why do I? What's the biggest problem I have now? I can think about that. Yeah, and you feel empowered, and they get engaged, and you love it, and it's just fun to see. Oh, that's brilliant! Yeah. Well, and would you say that the the guiding principles? So I've worked for several organizations that have tried to go on a lean sort of journey tried to, you know, change culture and so forth. The ones that I've seen most successful um, are the ones that have guiding principles in place that align with a lean type mindset, um, which is like, you know, we want to problem solve. We want to make sure we have a safe environment. We want to make sure that um, that our teams are engaged and working together rather than separate or in apart. Um, what would you recommend as some of those guiding principles for maybe some of these organizations that have decided, yes, I want to do it, but I don't know where to begin or I so, don't know what's right. Yeah. So let me just 
do a little bit of history of, of our experience at the Shingo Institute. So we administered the Shingo Prize and we have for 35 years now. Yeah, We have had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of really great companies apply for the Shingo Prize. We get a chance to send a team of experts out to evaluate them and then we get to see the results. So yeah. we have we have a very robust data set. I believe we, it. We get, we get to see the best of the best and then we get to see what happens to the best of the best after they receive the Shingo Prize too. Ah, yes. Do any so, backslide. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I'll be honest with you. We, for the first roughly 15 years of the Shingo Institute, the majority of recipients back experienced backsliding. Yeah. Okay? I believe and, and some of them so significantly that people came to us and said, you, you gave them a Shingo Prize? They're oh, terrible. That's so hard. <laughs> well, and it's, it's it's troubling to us too because mm -hmm. our our goal is to recognize the best of the best out there of course yeah and, and we want to you know advertise the fact these are the best of the best go see them if you want to learn how to do this yeah so we, we knew something was missing in our model because mm -hmm. we were evaluating them but they many of them were not able to sustain improvements over time yeah Okay, so so we we did over the course of roughly 2003 up until 2008 when we published the new shingle model, okay? Oh, right, okay. Our old, our old model, we looked at tools and systems and results. Okay. Okay, which which is all important. All of yep. those- All important. of it's good, yep. All of it's good, but we knew something was missing. Yes. And so when we started looking at the organizations that did this, you know, up and then down, and then compared them to the ones that went up and then kept going up. Uh-huh. Okay. And what was different about these guys? What, what did they do to keep that improvement sustained over time? And, yeah. and as we looked at the differences, it really was about the engagement of the people. Mm -hmm. The ones that did backsliding, it was driven by leadership or driven by leaders in engineering, mm -hmm. but did not engage the team members. Yeah. It didn't engage the whole organization. It was because they had a group of really dedicated leaders. Really good they guys. Made, and gals. They did a great yeah. job. They drove improvement. They got a shingle prize and then they got promoted or then they took another job somewhere else because they did such a great job here. They got hired away the or whatever. Was gone. And everything went downhill because- yep. They had not. They had not changed the culture. They had not changed the behaviors of the team members. The team members were not engaged. Yep. Lean had been done to them. Lean had not been done with them. If you understand the distinction. Totally. So when we looked at the ones that kept getting better and better, they had actively engaged their team members from the beginning. Ah. They get a single prize and the team members continue to be involved and they continue to keep getting better and better. And so mm -hmm. we knew the big difference that we saw had something to do with culture and the engagement of the team members. So that's yeah. what God is looking into. What did they do? How did they get the team members engaged? What was different about the way they did it than the way the others did it? Mm -hmm. And that's when we came up with those guiding principles of respect every individual and yeah. lead with humility is the leaders we saw in those organizations were listening to their people. They yeah. were giving them the, the resources they needed. They were giving them training. They had active training programs and, and, and they were training people on what the right behaviors were. They were actually measuring the right behaviors. And so we came up with one of the insights that we had was ideal results require ideal behaviors. Yes. But, yes. And, and I'll, I'll give you a simple example that we documented during this this research phase that we had was we looked at a company and, and the leader said, you know, we don't really worry about people getting hurt on the job anymore. It's a manufacturing firm. OK, so we don't really worry about people getting hurt on the job. Of course, we report that because we have to report it to OSHA. Yeah. But what we've been focusing on from the you know, and we focus on safety behaviors. And if, what what we want what we measure are number of safety issues that are reported. Yep. How quickly we address those, you know, on a timely basis, and mm -hmm. and then what we find is if there's ever a safety issue and we then prevent it from ever happening, from anybody ever getting harmed by that safety issue, then we don't have to worry about people getting harmed because mm -hmm. every time there's a safety issue, we fix it and we prevent it. It's a habit. 
Yeah. It's, it's a, and it's built into their system. Mm-hmm. They have a safety system of yep. it's all about prevention. Yes. And it's all about reporting and taking action so that nobody is ever harmed. And they say, we haven't had a recordable incident in years. Awesome. We don't have to worry about that because we have a system in place where we measure the behaviors. Mm-hmm. We measure the report. We measure the action taken to prevent. Yeah. And to us, that was like, aha, you can apply yeah. the same thinking to defects. You can apply the same thinking to maintenance and, and so on. Totally. And that's what we saw. We saw a culture of prevention where people, where they were measuring the behaviors wow. and not looking at the results and going, oh, we got to go fix that somehow. Wow. That's interesting. Because sometimes those are hard to measure. You know, the behaviors can sometimes are. And, be the and worst and, to measure. And knowing what the right right behaviors are that actually will move that results yeah. needle, that's really hard sometimes. For sure. Uh, but, you know, it's it's very consistent with, with Shingo's teachings, okay? Mm. So, I mean, this forces us to go back and look at uh, Shigeo Shingo, what he taught. And he was a, he was a quality guru and Mm-hmm. And for a long time, followed Deming and did taught SPC and, and statistical quality control and all of that. Yep. Then he had an epiphany one time. This is he in different writings and in different in his different books. He called it 26 years. Sometime it was 10 years. I don't know how long it was. Somewhere in that time. He, it's, he never says it was less than 10. Okay. The longest he ever said was 26 years where he said, I wasted my time looking at statistics because I was enamored by him. I loved the fact that you could measure this and measure that. And, and yeah. it would tell you what, what, and he said, what I, the point that I missed was all the time we spent measuring could have been spent eliminating and preventing. Yep. We were focusing on the wrong thing. He calls it measurement waste. Oh, I like that. And, yeah. and instead of instead of preventing defects, instead of you know just eliminating the defects, we were measuring defects. Wow! And it's like, why did I waste my time teaching people the statistics when I should have been teaching them get rid of the defects? Right, eliminate it prevent, in the eliminate first place. Them, prevent them from happening in the yeah. first place. And and you will get a lot farther and a, a lot faster if you focus on the right things instead of this measurement waste that we tend to get. We tend to yeah. love because statistics are cool. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then he realized when he when he realized that he also realized you know the problems are usually solved by the team members and they yeah. don't understand statistics typically anyway. So what yeah. we what we did by using statistics is we took even the analysis the responsibility for the defects out of their hands. Yeah. When we moved it into the statistical realm, it then became an engineering problem. Yes. Not a team member problem. Yeah. Which and is the real tragedy. But yeah. is a real tragedy. He says, we never should have done that. Yeah. We should have left it with the team members and given them the resources to figure out what their problems are and help them solve those problems because they know their problems better than anybody. For sure. So he, he just says, I, I, I realized I had wasted this period of time, whether it was 10 or 26 years or somewhere in between. I don't know. But uh, but he calls it his wasted time. He could have been teaching people a lot more effective ways of improvement than what he was teaching them. Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a principle. You know, we tie it back to a sure quality at the source, which we define the op- the person who's working, doing the work at the time the work is being done is the person who should be checking their own work. Yes. Making sure and then and whatever you can do to help them do that more efficiently and do a, a, just a quick check of it. So it's more efficient than somebody inspecting it later. Yes. It's, it's a better quality job because the person who knows the work the best is checking the work. And and then you're not passing work down so somebody else has to worry about it. You, you've, huh. I mean, there's so much when you do a sure quality at the source, the principle of quality at the source the right way, then it all make, then it all works. For sure. And it solves all those other problems that we were seeing in these organizations where team members weren't engaged. Mm-hmm. So if, there's, if you get yeah. them engaged, then you can do a sure quality source because they are engaged and they know they're empowered to take action if there's a quality problem. Whoa, wait a minute. I got to, we got to figure this one out. Or yeah. um, I don't know what's going on here, but I need to do some analysis. And let's take that aside and let's make sure that doesn't happen until we get a fix in place. Yes. 
you know, it gives them the power to make those kinds of decisions about how they're going to deal with the problem that's at their place of responsibility. Yeah. So, but it's, it's, it's what we discovered was there were in almost every situation, mm -hmm. the principles intertwined. Yeah. You respect every individual, but a sure quality at the source. And those two are, are bound together. You can't yeah. separate them. They're bound together. Yeah, and, and I think so, that's where some companies get screwed up or or no, mixed up. They, they try do. to keep each of these principles as being very separate. Yes. So they almost become initiatives rather and, than a, a way of working. Yes. And we see that as a problem in a lot of organizations. Even yeah. in good organizations, they struggle with it though too. It's, it's oh yeah. Constant. But, <laughs> right nobody's perfect that's nobody's one perfect. thing that i try to tell people all the time not even toyota's perfect the only thing um that's different with toyota and and other companies very similar to toyota um is that they're constantly challenging themselves yes. so they make a mistake they fix it they make a mistake they fix it um and they're just quicker at fixing it <laughs> than a lot of companies too <laughs> yeah and, but they've learned also how to get people engaged in in doing yeah. it and solving the right problems yes because a lot of times i mean there was one company i worked for where constantly the the continuous improvement team was the one that was deployed to solve the problems rather than the employees um deployed to solve the problems so it was like we had a ci team that was enormous enormous and it was a huge problem because it wasted time because the person quality source right the person that saw the problem that knows how to fix it wasn't involved in the solution of it and then it was tossed over the fence to the ci team who then had to get up to speed what's the problem why is this a problem how does the process work so it's like they had to learn how the system worked before they could even start problem solving when if they just went to the employee that saw it they could solve it like that instead of building an enormous continuous improvement team so so yes and and it's We've often seen that the CI team become the problem solvers and that takes the responsibility away from the people who need to have to be respected and say, this is your job. What can we do to help is, yeah. is what the CI team should be doing, not say it's my job to fix your job. Right. Yeah. So let me let me give you an example of best in the world. OK, yes, that would be great. When it comes to that. So. I had one of the organizations that we studied in our research was, you know, and they, they were a shingle price recipient in the 1990s and kept getting better and better and better and better. And we, we, we studied them and, and thoroughly, and we go, we've gone back to look at them frequently over the last, you know, decade and a half, just to keep saying, what are they doing now yeah. is, is Denso, their, their Tennessee facility. Ah. So in my, in one of my visits, it happened to coincide with their, team annual team competitions that they have on oh yeah so, so the way they structure it is each team has agreed to it as part of their uh catch ball hoshin kanji process they've agreed to do certain things that align with the goals of the organization okay right. so so and the i got to see the final competition and observe it Cool. And the, the the team that won, I'm going to tell you what you know what they did is they took on the reduced defect challenge. Ooh, it's a big and, one. And, they, and and so what they did is in their presentation they had like ten minutes to present, and they went through one by one by one different things they implemented to reduce to prevent a defect from happening. Oh, cool. And and they said this got us from this level of PPM down to this level of PPM. This one took us from this PPM level down to this, down to this, down. And they systematically took it down to where it was below PPM at the end of the year. Amazing. So and and luckily they make enough parts so they can actually measure that. So so they know they know what they're doing. Yeah. And and I just and they did like six different things. So they spent like 
a minute and a half on each of those things. So it was kind of a rapid fire, bang, 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 bang. And I'm just stunned by how the, the complexity and the deep and how, how well thought out each of those steps were. Yeah. And I, so I, I said, you know, I'm just an observer, but I said, can I ask a question? You know, because the judges <laughs> were asking questions too, but I said, can I ask a question? I said, did you get any help in doing any of those? And, and the team lead stepped forward and he goes, he backed up a couple of slides and said, on this problem, in order to understand it better, we figured out we needed to do a regression analysis, but none of us knew how to do, knew how to do it. And so we went to one of the engineers and he taught us how to do it. Oh my gosh. That's not, even awesome. we, not only we asked the engineer to do it for us. No, 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 no. We, we got him to teach us how to do it ourselves. That's amazing. And I just go, oh, wow. Meaning they did all of this themselves, but they knew if they needed help, they could go get help. But Brilliant. Their responsibility. They took responsibility for it. They made every change. Wow. And, and it was just, what a, what a powerful example of, of what huh. team members can do when they feel empowered and they're enabled and they are well-trained. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So they, th what's cool about it is they, they took it head on. Yes. They didn't say, oh, we need a statistician for this portion. So we're going to let the statistician do it. Mm -mm. They were like, no, teach us. Cause we, we know we need to do it. Well, but not only that, the, the, but the training was so good. They could, Amazing. You know, they felt, they felt like, oh yeah, we can do this. I mean, the whole attitude was, yeah, we, no, not everybody's going to be at that point. Right. They need help. Okay. And and I don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm not advocating for not helping. I am advocating course, yeah. for training them so they can solve their own problems because they can. Yeah. But if they can, then give them the resources they need, but don't take the responsibility away from them. Yeah. You know, you know support them, provide the resource to them and, and, and the, but make it their response, respect them in that way that we yeah. respect you for the work you do. And we know you can do this. Let us know what you need to, uh, to help you. Yeah. Well, that's a much more powerful way of engaging people than, oh, we've got a CI team that can solve that for you. So oh, you, yeah, they'll, you they'll just, just handle back it. And let these experts come in and solve your problems yeah. for you. Like, oh, no, no, that no, was no, the no. worst. Because yeah. being on the CI person, the CI team in that sense, already you're a jack of all trades, right? And now all of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh, I've got to be a statistician now. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, we can share the load. <laughs> so we, when we see these kind of best of the best examples, and, yeah. and I'll give a couple of other uh, uh, um, when it comes to it, it all comes. There's a, there's an underlying culture that it yeah. drives it and that's yeah. what that was the big that was the big find so i oh. let me go back to what i was talking about before we had the systems tools and results were part of our model we added two more things as a result oh, of the right result. one was culture yep and we define culture and as evaluate when we're doing an assessment we define culture as the sum of the behaviors oh okay yeah okay it, and and don't tell us the behaviors by pointing to something that's printed on and put up on the wall. Yep. Let us Gotta observe. See it. Let us ask. Let us find out. Let us dive uh -huh. into it so we know what the so you know what did you have to do to get that idea implemented? Did you have to go around everything or did you get support? Did, yeah. you, know, you know that sort of thing. And then it also includes just watching their safety behaviors, watching to see whether or not they follow their standard work, watching you know all of that is just observing behaviors. And then evaluating those behaviors yeah. and based, we evaluate them based upon the guiding principles. How well do you, do you demonstrate that you respect every individual? How well do you demonstrate that you're trying to assure quality of the source? How well do you, and so on. Uh, and that the other one we added was just the guiding principles. <laughs> You've got to have that. And, and, and so we've added those guiding principles as part of our assessment model but it's tied to the behaviors. We don't see yeah. the the principles in action until we see the actions. Yeah, and, of course. And that, that has made it so the organizations that have received the Shingo Prize afterwards, we know that their culture has been impacted. It's not mm -hmm. just a group of leaders at the top. It has to have be embedded in the entire organization. Yeah. And, and that is way more sustainable yeah. than just a group of leaders driving change and then leaving. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it's it. true. Um, so, for sure. With some of the ones that backslid, because I'm sure you've, you know, been back and, and, and looked at them again, what has been your advice for them? Cause ob- it's probably obvious that they backslid. Yeah. And, and a lot of the people know it, but they, uh, they often can tell us, well, it's, everything was driven by these people and they left mm. or, or we got bought out and they brought in a new leadership team or yeah. we went to a reorganization because our corporate headquarters did this. Yeah. We had, we, I do have one example of where culture beat corporate headquarters though. Really? Yeah. So, so the, the this is a, a, group leader who had several organizations within the group who had received the shingo prize oh, okay and it was the most profitable part of the organization <laughs> but corporate headquarters thought that they were being too nice to the people <laughs> and as he described it he said i asked him why he got fired and he said they they kept telling me i was being too nice to the people and i needed to ride them harder Oh my gosh, that militant mindset. The militant mindset. And and uh <laughs> and, and I said, and so you got fired again? Yeah. So then they then they tried to bring in one a command and control person and they drove him out. Good, they should. They did. But <gasps> but then corporate then reorganized everything in a different way. So it 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 kept them empowered at the local level, but it didn't solve the leadership gap that was by by having them fire all the the leaders that were leading with humility but leading well yeah and 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 so it they managed to drive out the command and control guy um and they also managed to maintain autonomy so that they could keep the engagement of their team members in place but but it hurt it hurt because the leadership left yeah for sure before, before they forced out the replacement leaders but it was it was an interesting dynamic to watch, and, I and bet. It, it's like they how stupid can you be as a corporate executives to to take your best performing unit and drive out the leaders because you just disagree with the way they do things? Well, what idiots! A smart look at the, look at the results. Look at the yeah. Results. A smart CEO would look at that and be like, "They're doing something different. I'm going to move that guy to my trouble place." No, and no. I'm going to try to change the culture there, but you would, think, you would think that would be the logical thing to do, but yeah, no, it, was, it, was more, it was more politics and command and control and oh, do it brutal. my way or else. And, and it was like, they, they said, then, then no, I'm, we're going to do it our way because it's, it's got the best results and then they got fired. So. Wow, it's, it's so it's kind of it's kind of a it's kind of a sad thing when you hundred percent. That that's thing. awful. Well, and then that totally, you know, could have it could have. Thankfully, they were resilient, and it didn't happen this way. But it could have totally destroyed any progress that those it good sites have. made. It could have. It could have. Case, in this case, the culture won. Unfortunately, the awesome. leadership was sacrificed in the process. Yeah. Oh. Oh, but hopefully that leadership ended up in another place that They're ended up fine. being better They're anyway. Doing, doing fine. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad because that's the worst. Um, so that. Oh gosh. Yeah. So I, I one, promise to I promise yeah. to share another best yes, of the best please. example. So I, I'm going to pick a different uh, principle. Uh, and, and this one is create constancy of purpose. And we oh, we, yes. we put this in the shingle model. It's it's Deming's phrasing and we borrowed it. You know, it's number one of Deming's 14 points, but it's one that is so important. We included it as a shingle guiding principle because it is so important. Yes. Um, we find so many organizations that make people make improvements that don't tie to the purpose of the organization. Like, why did you do that? They can't tell you why. How does that relate to your purpose? don't know what or is our purpose? Go, what is our exact <laughs> we don't, what's our purpose i don't know what it is okay and we know we've got a communication problem in this organization yes <laughs> they have a clarity to find purpose out on the wall outside in the lobby but it's a nobody huge inside, poster <laughs> nobody inside knows what that is that's our problem okay yes. so but so we do see a lot of that but but the best organization when it comes to aligning around a purpose we've we've seen in our studies has been auto lead oh yes 
Uh huh. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They make I am. I've toured them. Yes. For, for cars, and you go in. You know, I'll take you to the step that amazes me the most. But I've had the chance to ask the same question I often ask, which is, "Tell me about. Have, have you had any ideas?" And I've never had somebody answer that question with a no in auto uh-huh. It's always been a yes. Never, a, never a person out of the twenty or thirty people I've asked. And then I asked them, well, tell me about the last one you did. And when they do their explanation, Mm. they not only walk me through step by step what they did and what the result was, but they also tie it to the greater purpose of the organization, which is they put it in a little catchphrase of we save lives. Oh, so yes. They, they they say, we made this change, it did this, it did this, or, and they'll say, and that reduces the, the, the potential for a defect, so we're preventing a defect from happening, and that will save lives. Or, wow. or they will say, this was an efficiency improvement that allows us to, fo- gives us time to focus on solving some of our other problems that will help save lives. Or wow. now, and and I'll, I'll give you the most extreme example. I'm, I'm, talking to one of their accountants and i hmm. said to her do do people in support functions have ideas oh yeah have you ever submitted an idea oh yeah well tell me about the last one you did and so she goes through the same sort of process of and and she was responsible for tracking safety stocks you know they they like to have uh, you know no stock of course but yeah but they have to have safety stock in case there's a problem with a vendor because they can't always control their vendors Yes. So they look at the performance of a vendor and say, we've got to have this much on hand just in case so we don't shut down our line. Yeah. So it's just, we had a vendor that we've been working with, that I've been working with, and and their performances have improved, but we hadn't reevaluated them based upon our criteria. And so we oh. went back and did an evaluation of them and decided that we could reduce our safety stock by $50,000. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. and, and it's just, so that's fifty thousand dollars that was freed up in the budget. Yeah, we reallocated it to this R and D project because if we if we invest that fifty thousand, we could move up the timeline of this R and D project. And this R and D project is about changing this feature in our airbags that will make them safer. Wow! And it's like so so you know, so she walks through this whole thing, and once again it goes back to we're we're They're saving lives. Safe lives. And so even the accountants are saying, no, if you look at their little, they have a little idea card you fill out. Yeah. There's a section on it that forces this thinking and this behavior. Ah. Says, How does this idea tie to our goal of saving lives? Ha, huh, I like it. Don't so you- it's reinforcing it all it's, the time. It's always reinforced. So everybody is thinking when they think about ideas, yeah. they are always thinking about how does it tie to our greater purpose? Yeah. How do we- so how do you create constancy of purpose? Yeah. You create a great culture and that culture is built around that purpose. And so when people are thinking about improvement, they are also thinking about the purpose and how do we accomplish that purpose. It's a wonderful filter for them to go through. You know, they, they may think of something that is an improvement in, for some reason, Yeah. but it's not going to be that important to them if it doesn't tie to the purpose somehow. Yeah. It just kind of provides that alignment. Maybe a good oh, idea yeah. and, and maybe they'll entertain it. But but for the most part, we want you to be thinking about how do we accomplish our purpose of saving lives? Oh, I and love it. If people buy into the purpose, mm-hmm. that's what they're going to be thinking about. They're going to be yeah. thinking about how can I do this better? I, yeah. And I'd like to think at the Shingo Institute, our biggest goal is helping organizations improve the process of improvement, how yeah. to learn it faster, how to implement it sooner, how to get the mm-hmm. result more quickly. So you don't have to, you know, the idea is don't have to learn it over 40 years like I did. We can learn it much more quickly without all the scars that you need to have all along the way. How do we improve the process of improvement? And and everything we think of, we try to run through this filter of how is this help us improve the process of improvement? Is this helping the people that we interact with improve the process of improvement? And if it is, then great, let's do it. Yeah. And and I think every organization benefits from that constancy of purpose. But AutoLeave just stands out as one of those really good examples of best best of the best, if you know what I mean. Yeah, best of the best for constancy of purpose and really having that vision of of what they're trying to do. So many 
so many organizations struggle with that. Um, you know, when when you go through your annual Hoshin Connery thing, a lot of them usually um, the goals are about saving money, <laughs> saving costs somewhere, you know, cutting the budget, like doing blah, 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 blah. And out of the, the companies that I've seen where they're focusing mostly on cost and not on a constancy of purpose, purpose that yes. in, impacts their customer and the lives of their employees, um, they end up focusing on the wrong things and the wrong problems. And so, um, and a couple of them, unfortunately, have gone out of business um, because they were so focused on cost cutting that they ended up cutting the people that were making a difference <laughs> and making a name for themselves. Um, so that's also something to think about in terms of how to reinforce that culture and the constancy of purpose when you do your annual planning as well. Yeah. Um, making sure that the messaging is still there that we're, you know, we're trying to make a happy work environment or we want safety as number one, whatever that constancy is, um, it's got to be reinforced through the goals for the annual, you know, for the year yes, as well. It does. It does. So yeah. getting back to this, this idea of culture and guiding principles. Yes. Those guiding principles can really define the culture in profound ways. And and that's why mm -hmm. I choose that as one example of a, a principle that is in best of the best is yes, it, it does impact everything they do. Every idea they have, the work that people do, you know, the team members do in creating yeah. the product, they are always thinking about this purpose. Yeah. And they buy into the person. They may not like certain things about their job and they may not like yeah. even people they work with or even their bosses, yeah. or whatever it may be, but they buy into that culture. Yeah. They buy into the idea of, I don't want to make a defect on this airbag because it may cost somebody their life. And I don't yes. want them to die because of me. Yeah. And, and, and so they take responsibility for it and, and that purpose Beautiful. drives them. And it's wonderful to see. And we see that in a lot of organizations mm -hmm. and, and, the best organizations all have a purpose that people, you know, you can go out and ask them, what's the purpose of this organization? They tell you. Yeah. And if they don't, you know there's a problem because it's either a communication problem or a lack of clarity about what do we exist for. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and leaders need to be, you know, how do we clarify what we exist for and how do we share that with people and get them to buy in and yeah. and drive that alignment is a is yeah. an important part. Yeah. It's fabulous. Um, my goodness, our time together has just flown by. Um, one last, uh, one last question um, for you. Um, what is the role of leadership in culture change? And what do you see most often? And what do you think leaders can do to change or improve what they do? So, so we have the principle lead with humility. Yes. And the, the most important thing of, of that is, is listening and acting on what you hear. Yeah. So, so I, I love, we, we put together a video that we use in our, our workshops of Dietzo Shingo, the son of Shigeo Shingo, who, you know, as I mentioned, spent over 40 years with Toyota, but uh, a, about half of that time he spent in, in the Toyota the best translation of the of the department is is purchasing but that, oh. that invokes a whole different meaning because yeah. the purchasing people are the ones that develop their suppliers and so they spend a lot of time training and coaching the supply chain if you will so mm -hmm. working with tier one tier two suppliers and going out as senseis and teaching them tps and how can you better supply us apart so that we can make sure our cars don't break down you know yeah to call it purchasing is is kind of like transactional and it is not transactional it is more training people yeah yeah and, and he literally went out in his 20 years in toyota purchasing went out and visited hundreds and hundreds of companies and selected the best of the best that he saw out there to be suppliers and then trained them in the Toyota way and the you know, Toyota production system on how to be a really good quality supplier. Yeah. So, so he's, he has that mindset. And then he spent about 20 more years running different divisions of Toyota. So he got to see the whole, the value. whole gamut. So he, he had, we, 
he has some, some really great insights on how to go visit companies and see what the problems are. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we've adapted that and we put it into a video, but, but he has, he, he talks about as a leader, when you go out and, and visit the, the Gimba. Yeah. What do you do? Do you go, just go see what the results are? No. <laughs> you know, that's, that's tourism again. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but but he had his his own way of saying, and he 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 would do this. You go you go out with big eyes, so you can see the problems. Ah, uh, right, yeah. And listen to the people. Yeah. But you go out with a small mouth, <laughs> so that you listen and don't say anything. Because as soon as you start saying something, they'll shut up. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I love I love the big eyes, big ears because it implies what what are you there for? Well, yeah. you're there to understand. You are there to help. You are there to provide guidance only, but only if they ask for it. Yeah, that's a pull thing, and and don't let them you know let them pull it out of you, but don't push it on them because yeah. then all of a sudden they'll stop thinking for themselves, and then it's command and control again. But yeah, so big eyes, big ears, small mouth. I love it. That's that's one thing. Another one that he taught us was show them your back is is how he phrased it. But it's lead by example. Hmm. Um, I I like leaders, and and some people think you can't lead with humility without being a demanding leader. I would argue it's just the opposite. If you lead with humil- humility, that gives you the power to be a demanding leader. Hmm. Because then you can expect your people to take responsibility more fully than you would if you're doing command and control. Yeah. We need you to do this. And if you do this, then we can accomplish this type of leadership. Now, tell me what you need. And and yeah. will you take responsibility? You know, catch ball. Will you take responsibility for it? And if they sincerely say, yes, we'll do it. Uh-huh. And give them the resources they need to do it. You can get more out of them. You can raise the bar, if you will, and expect more because you're leading with humility then yeah. you can if you're commanding control because when you tell them what to do all they can do is do that and you can't tell them to do more because you've already told them what to do you can't expect more because you've already told them what to do yeah. you can expect more out of people when you empower them and engage them so leading with humility i think enables better performance it allows you to be to raise the bar if you will yeah and, and raise your expectations I'll I'll just share one final story. One yes. of the best of the best organizations we looked at and keep studying told us this story. They said we we got our people engaged and empowered and and we used to set goals for them. And they'd always hit the goal. And often they'd hit the goal within six months of our planning session. Then we had the annual planning session Let's six months later way. and set the new goal for the new year. And <laughs> we thought maybe we shouldn't be setting the goals for them. Yeah. Duh, kind of. <laughs> why don't we let them set their own goals? So, so why don't we say, here's what we need. We need to improve efficiency because of, and give them the reason why, focus on efficiency this year. And wh- how much do you think you can do? What do you think you can do to improve the efficiency of, of your team? Yeah. And then give them a chance to go back and research and come back. And they and what we found is they'd come back with a number twice as big as, you know, and if we gave him 15% and we were thinking 15% in they'd our head, they'd come back with 30, <laughs> come back with 30 and then they'd do 30. And what we realized is we were suppressing their potential wow. by, giving, by assigning goals to them. Yeah. Rather than letting them come up with their own goals. And sometimes they'd pick 30 and they'd only hit 28, <laughs> but it was still way better. Than still the way better. Way better than the 15 we were thinking. And it's like, we, if we're really going to respect people, respect yeah. the fact that maybe they can do more than what we think they can do too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> respect their potential. <laughs> yeah. Promote so, their growth. <laughs> yeah. So some, ho- hopefully there's some good, good lessons. We I've tried to pick some yeah. good stories from things we've observed with organizations in the past that hopefully could be useful to Brilliant. others out there that might, might listen to this. And I hope yeah. it goes well. Yeah, this has been a fantastic hour together. Um, I I appreciate you so much, Ken. Um, I'm so glad that we were uh, introduced and were able to cross paths. Um, I've learned so much every single time we talk to each other. And um, I'm grateful um, that we've had this connection for sure. Thank you so much for taking time 
to do this and to talk with my small little watching group online. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Michelle. It's been fun. <laughs> this has been great. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to share? Oh, there's, there's lots of things that we could share, <laughs> but let's, let's call it. Let's, we'll save them for another time. <laughs> we'll save them for another time. Save them for another Fantastic. time. Fantastic. Well, thank you again, Ken. I appreciate it. I hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, we'll talk again soon. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>